Good morning and welcome to Live1.tv's Presidential Forum Debate 2024 with candidates Mike Terramat and Emmanuel Pastreich. Both candidates will present their platform's ideas and we'll do a Q&A with our live audience. Okay, super. Are we all un unmuted? Everybody yeah. can hear? All right. Uh, welcome our audience and our two candidates for our presidential forum and debate talk with a Q&A from our listeners. Uh, thank you, coming candidate Mike Termont and Emmanuel Pastreich. First, let's hear our opening uh, remarks from candidate Pastreich. Please, Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Well, it's an honor to be here. Uh, this discussion, this debate between myself uh, and Mike uh, is the launch of the 2024 presidential campaign and the beginning of truth politics in the United States after a 60-year period of hibernation. When I say the beginning, I mean that Joe Biden and Donald Trump, regardless of who they may be or what they may say, are so deeply involved in the promotion of and the defense of state crimes that they are unqualified for office, as are the vast majority of political figures today. We must start with truth, not donations from billionaires. We must first recognize that we are not in a country that is losing democracy, but rather that we are already living in a country and a world controlled by private banks, IT corporations, military and intelligence units, and a handful of extremely wealthy families who hide behind the curtain of trusts and funds. We must build a constitutional republic from the ground up, granted that we will use the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence as our foundation. And the best ethical teachings to inspire our citizens to listen to their better angels. But first, we must cure the illness of decadence, narcissism, corruption, and the outsourcing of government to for-profit groups who have no loyalty to the Constitution, the government, the, the people. And that means drinking the bitter tonic known as truth, which is the only cure for the institutional and spiritual cancer that has metastasized throughout the body politic of the United States of America. We must start with the three great state crimes, facing them, putting forth a plan to resolve them, and moving forward will, in and of itself, transform our nation. Those state crimes are, the, the main ones, the 9-11 incident and its aftermath, the quantitative, quantitative easing, COVID relief, illegal counterfeiting regimes for multinational banks and private equity, and the COVID-19 regime. These state crimes are linked to most all of the other problems that we face today. We here gathered today are numerous enough to start the process of ethical and tr spiritual transformation for our nation and to snap our people out of this Roman imperial decay that we see everywhere. As the anthropologist Margaret Mead remarked, never underestimate the ability of a small dedicated group to change the world. In fact, it is the only way that it has ever been done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel Pastreich. Candidate Mike Tormont, please. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me on. And uh, Emmanuel, thanks for joining as well. And Melissa, thanks for handling uh, all of our technology here. We're grateful for the, for the time spent with you. I am seeking the Libertarian Party nomination. There are several candidates uh, doing so. I am currently widely recognized as the front runner, but I want to emphasize that I am not uh, what one might characterize as the presumptive nominee. We are yet to go to our convention in Washington in just a couple of weeks to secure the nomination, as I believe that I will, but I don't want to accidentally mislead people. The Libertarian Party is not just a uh, third party in the United States. We are the third party. We are the party that has in the past had access in all 50 states. We're working very hard at the moment to secure that once again, and we expect that that will be the case. I am running on a platform 
of bold principles, libertarian principles. And the reason for that is because I believe that libertarian principles are American principles. Mm -hmm. Libertarianism is, after all, the philosophical descendant of the philosophy of the founding fathers. The idea that we should be living in and protecting a pluralistic democracy, that we should be adhering to a constitution of the limited powers, practicing such principles as fiscal conservatism and protecting the United States, not getting the United States involved in foreign wars. I believe that the United States government has gone off the rails in any number of ways, violating these very fundamental principles. I agree with Emmanuel. We live in a post-constitutional nation today, which is weird. And not just weird, but a very bad thing. I think most economists would agree with me. I was a professional economist for more than two decades. And I believe that most economists would agree with me. I think the most Americans would agree with me that the U.S. government is going to face a financial collapse before the middle of this century. This is a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. It's not an organization that adds a lot of value to our lives. It's not like you would miss it. The problem is that a collapse of the federal government would lead to a collapse of financial markets all over the world, especially as it's tripped by the bond market and, and collapse the U.S. dollar. This would plunge us into a deep depression worldwide. And the citizens of the world and the citizens of the United States deserve better. We need to right this ship. If you're waiting for a Republican politician to lead us back to fiscal conservatism or a constitution of delimited powers, I would argue you're waiting for something that's not going to happen. And I would say the same thing about the Democratic Party. That's a group of politicians that no longer adheres to the agenda that it used to. And so in that sense, I think that 2024 is a huge opportunity for the Libertarian Party. I think everyone agrees with that. This is the talk of the town. But more importantly, I think this is an obligation. I think there's a call of duty for a libertarian-minded, a libertarian party, a libertarian-minded candidate to lead the charge back toward the Constitution, to cap federal spending, to harden the U.S. dollar by getting rid of the Federal Reserve System and replacing it with a system of rules not this silly system of utter discretion and allowing some federal agency to issue as much money as it wants, driving up inflation, undermining our way of living. I think that it's high time that we answer the call of duty to change our foreign policy, to stop this idea of the United States engaging in proxy wars all over the world, in Ukraine, in the Middle East. And we're obliged through NATO, we're obliged to potential future wars with the Russian army in Europe. And the Biden administration has already obliged us to a war with China if China goes after Taiwan. I don't like the idea of China going after Taiwan, but am I willing to plunge the United States into World War III over microchips? No, I'm not. I believe that the foreign policy of the United States does not align with American values. It does not align with the principles of American voters. And so I believe that the Libertarian Party has an obligation, has an opportunity. This is our call of duty. I look forward to answering your questions. We can't hear you, Ian. Ian's muted. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Let's follow up with the economics on that. Why don't you tell us, why don't we start with Emmanuel and then back to you, Mike. Uh, it seems to me, Emmanuel, that your plan for increasing the wealth of the nation has a lot to do with stopping some of the crimes that are going on. Is that correct, that by correcting some of these state crimes that will actually help the economy? That is correct. Uh, and I, I would like to say, that the position I take is it's not a unique one, uh, but it is different than the Libertarian Party's position now. And you, some people would say it's more extreme. Uh, I think it's probably uh, uh, required. Uh, and that would be to say uh, that we can get quite a lot of money to start with 
uh, simply by pursuing the financial responsibility for state crimes. Uh, so if we just take the issue of uh, uh, quantitative easing and COVID relief, uh, these were essentially counterfeiting operations undertaken by m major multinational banks and private equity in which they dictated to the Federal Reserve and the Department of Treasury to print up. Uh, we don't even know how many tens of trillions of dollars. So if we get that money back, that would already be a massive uh, uh, help to the United States in, in and of itself. And the other two cases I, I gave uh, as well, obviously would have financial uh, uh, accountability involved, which would bring us in a lot of money. But that's that would not be a permanent solution to it. I, I basically agree uh, that uh, we have to come back to a solid money. The question would be how you do that. Uh, that is to say, if you simply say we go back to the gold standard, uh, if gold is all owned by billionaires, that in itself doesn't necessarily save solve you all your problems. You have to create, uh, I mean, I've written a series of five talks on this question about uh, called uh, 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 Money is No Mystery, based upon an earlier speech from the from the, uh, a series by uh, uh, Father Calderon from the 19. Uh, 30s, talking about the question of what money is now the Federal Reserve works. But anyway, I've gotten a little bit off the topic, but uh, I think uh, obviously taking back uh, the control of money, how the value of money is assigned, taking away from private banks uh, and unaccountable uh, 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 forces is obviously going to be key. Uh, I think there is a clear difference in perspective about the role of government, and I, I hope we can talk a little bit about that going forward. You're, you're muted again, Ian. Thank you. Mike, what do you think about Emmanuel's <clears throat> ideas that there could be money uh, reclaimed almost by ending the criminal domination of a few state uh, criminal actors? You're, well, I, you have I a background think... both in finance and law. Uh, I have a deep background as a professional economist, as well as an academic economist, as well as a an economist for the White House, and I spent a decade doing business uh, battling the Federal Reserve System. Uh, I think a couple of different things need to be said. The lion's share of what's wrong with our economy is that our government spends too much money, the Federal Reserve prints too much money, the government borrows too much money, the government uh, taxes too much money, the government regulates our economy too much. These are the big issues. What we need to do to solve our problems economically is get the federal government out of our lives. Number one, that means capping federal spending. That's where all evil comes from is government spending. However, it's financed, whether government uh, spending is financed through taxation, whether it's financed through inflation, whether it's financed through raising debt, those are all problematic. The fundamental problem is the government spends too much money. You need to cap federal spending. When I worked for the White House in the 1990s, going way back, the uh, the budget was controlled by what we called budget control law. We don't have that today. It didn't work perfectly then. But the idea is to make it very, very difficult for Congress to spend uh, more money. And what we want is an <laughs> overall umbrella cap to relieve Congress of the political obligation to pick out specific programs to cut back, because we know as a political matter, practically speaking, Congress is never going to vote for a particular program to be cut back. So what we want to do is create an umbrella, cap spending, and then bring that umbrella down over time and give all the programs a haircut uh, across the board. It's the only political feasible way to do it. We do need to make profound changes in the way the Federal Reserve System works. I believe that fundamentally we need to get rid of the Fed. The Fed conducts monetary policy by, I, I think most Americans would be pissed off if they knew this. This is not a metaphor. How it's actually done is that every six weeks we you know, get 12 people together in a room and basically ask them what mood they're in. That's no way to set a price for anything much less the most important price in the world, which is to say short-term interest rates on the U.S. dollar. It's a horrible way to do business. 
ethically, I've got a problem with it. Ethically, I've got a problem with the Federal Reserve's existence fundamentally, but never mind the values, the principles, and the ethics behind it. As a practical matter, we know by watching the Federal Reserve System over the last 100 years that the Fed is just objectively speaking, empirically speaking, unable to live up to its mandate of mitigating the boom and bust cycle. It's just a system that doesn't work, notwithstanding the best efforts of a lot of earnest people, a lot of smart people, I'm sure a lot of patriotic people. It's a system that just doesn't work. And so we need to replace it with a system that says this government is not allowed to issue more money than to target a 0% inflation rate. We need to replace the Fed with a rules-based system. I, I agree with both of everything you guys have both said. I agree with wholeheartedly. So um, you both seem very in sync with each other. Like you, you're on the same page with our generation even. We all see these same problems. So I'm just curious. Um, I guess we'll start with Emmanuel again and then go to Mike. I'm curious, what is your background politically and your roads into this, um, hopefully, into this new career. Right. Well, I, I, I think there really is a difference, I just say just briefly, between Mike and I about government, and I hope we can come back to that later. In terms of myself, I started as a professor of uh, Asian studies. I worked on Japan, Korea, and China at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, started in 1998. Uh, and uh, in the course of, of my career, I discovered that Asian studies was not funded uh, appropriately to the importance of Asia. And this led me to un try and understand what was wrong with the United States, that we were underestimating the importance of Asia. Uh, and uh, in terms of this uh, campaign, uh, I started in 2020 as an independent candidate in February, and that was uh, inspired by the COVID-19 regime uh, and the zombie apocalypse of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, Joe Biden, in which I, I felt very strongly that there could not possibly be a winner in that election who would have legitimacy as a president. And sadly, I was not disappointed. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I grew up uh, in uh, corporate finance and commercial finance. When I got out of engineering school and business school, I went to work for financial institutions. Later on, I went back to graduate school to study economics. I was at the George Washington University, a very uh, pro free market environment, which was terrific and put me in good stead for the rest of my career. I have taught economics at three different universities. Uh, a wide range of uh, topics, uh, including international trade, international finance. I've worked as a professional economist uh, a couple of years for the White House, a couple of years for other uh, international agencies. I spent about a decade in Washington as a professional advocate, mostly in the financial services space for greater competition, for deregulation, for free markets. I spent almost another decade uh, having launched uh, a firm with a partner of mine in strategic consulting for financial uh, firms and nonprofits and providing executive education, mostly for financial services professionals. As a second career in public service and, and public policy, I worked as a police officer. I was on the road for 11 and a half years in South Florida in Broward County from the age of 49 to 60, which is to say until a couple of years ago, I was lucky. I was able to find a, a good police agency that had a separate unit for vice. So I didn't have to get involved personally with the stuff that I consider stupid, like the war on drugs or, um, you know, prostitution stings and stuff like that. And they had a separate traffic unit. So I didn't have to get involved with, you know, the quotas that some towns want you to hit to, to raise revenue. So I actually had a very, very good experience and learned the hard way and the easy way, I learned that the difference between good police work and bad police work is fundamentally a respect for the Bill of Rights. And that became all the more clear as our nation went through the, the COVID mania, the COVID regime. And I, I have to give a shout out to my Republican friends at the 
police department, most of the cops that I knew were registered Republicans, who, along with myself, uh, joined me in giving a, a tremendous amount of pushback to the administration regarding uh, the enforcement that our county and our town wanted us to perform regarding shutting down you know, social affairs and businesses and stuff like that. We weren't having it. And I was very proud of the guys for that. So I had a good experience. Excellent. <clears throat> Ian, do you have another question? Yeah, I'd like to ask both uh, candidates, um, <clears throat> what their feel, if we can, we'll get back to the other issues. I think we were kind of a role on what, 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 what um, Emmanuel would like to talk about, the role of government, and this fits into it as well. Last month, the government awarded Northrop Grumman a contract to build a lunar railroad. I believe <laughs> the plan is they're going to extract cesium um, from the lunar soil. And I did a little background check, and sure enough, there's the DARPA grant for um, Northrop Grumman to build this lunar railroad. So the question for both of you is, how important is space exploration? And do you think that the government is within its realm to be budgeting for these types of things or should the commercial space agency take it alone? So space exploration and the role of government. Emmanuel, please. Right, so the, I think the fundamental difference uh, that we need to identify here is uh, my position, or I should say our position for people like-minded, is uh, that we have this world in which we have government, and then we have multinational corporations and banks. Uh, and uh, multinational banks, multinational corporations, and, and private banks are not an alternative to government. They are, in fact, another form of government, but they're more opaque, more totalitarian, and their interest is short-term profit. Uh, so uh, saying that we're going to get rid of government and replace it with multinational, like Lockheed Martin, for example, which is not an American company. It's owned stock by uh, investors behind the curtain of funds and, and trusts uh, around the world, including uh, people quite hostile to us, um, that to replace government with these organizations is not a, a step forward. Uh, that what we really need is a smaller government, uh, which is actually uh, in, accountable to the Constitution, in which you have public officials uh, who are held to high ethical standards in a transparent manner, uh, and that uh, we move away uh, from this control by multinational corporations and banks. Uh, and what we have in the case of, of space exploration, I mean, at this point, uh, I'm not even sure how much to believe of what I'm told about uh, what's going on in space. Uh, I think it's extremely dangerous uh, that in the case of, for example, Starlink, that we have private uh, multi-billionaires uh, controlling space. Uh, and of course, in the case of Starlink, it's in a series of classified uh, programs uh, for uh, uh, armed uh, military use uh, satellites, uh, which may be used for who knows what, uh, it's extremely dangerous for the citizens of the United States and the world. Uh, so what we really need is a very small government and to get rid of have these private interests uh, taking on these dangerous roles in an unaccountable way. And I'll just add one footnote to that, and that that is the most dangerous part of what's happened in the United States over the last 20 years is the rise of secret governance. And this lies behind this privatization and unaccountable sort of cancerous merging of private of private corporations and government. Uh, and secret government takes three forms. It takes, well, more than three forms, but the, the main one is non-disclosure agreements in which people working for government or for companies working with government are not allowed to discuss um, the criminal actions that they, they're involved in, that they can go to jail or be fined hundreds of thousands of dollars. The second is secret law. So the Congress passes laws, federal law, but there are also secret laws, which have the same effect as, as federal law, but cannot be disclosed. But they can be quite effective. For example, you could have a secret law that says that Mike and I can never be on TV. Uh, and this would be the effect of federal law. And the third is classified directives, which are used increasingly now with the uh, and, uh, the 
Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. There's an attempt to uh, extend classified directives into the Department of Education, which means the government officials can direct what your children learn and the teachers who are instructed at K-12 uh, not to teach these certain books are not going to be allowed to tell you. In fact, that was one of the big issues with the FISA extension was it includes uh, sections which say that if an individual, say Mike or myself, are served through a national security letter limiting our activities, that we're not allowed to consult with a lawyer about it. So I got a little way, a bit away from space, but that that would be the basic, I think, difference in perspective. Thank you. Super. A, a, a gag order that includes the inability to contact an attorney. Did I hear that right? I, I can give you that material if you'd like. But that, that's in the FISA extension, the, the new law. It has been expanded uh, so that if you're served with a national security letter or you get a classified directive, that you are you can be penalized for consulting with a lawyer about this classified information. That sounds very strict. Mike, do you have any comments on what your executive branch would be doing regarding industry, space exploration, and partnerships with uh, big tech and government? Sure. To answer your uh, question about space exploration, I don't know if you want me to answer the previous question, the one you just posed. Uh, space exploration uh, will be very important to the future of our economy. All the more reason to keep government out of it, not into it. I would also indicate, and I speak as someone with a degree in aeronautical engineering, I would uh, hasten to add that this is wholly premature. Technology is not caught up to our government's aspirations for how to control space. The correct way to deploy resources in space and to allocate resources in space is through the private sector. There's no question about that. You don't want government making these decisions or taking your resources and using them to uh, either to contract Northrop to develop a, a rail on the moon or to do anything else in outer space. When the government does it, it deploys resources uh, in the wrong sectors. It does so ineffectively. It does so inefficiently. And this is where this idea of crony capitalism comes from. The government has gotten too big. It controls too much of our resources. And yes, American citizens, corporations frequently do compete and lobby and try to control the government for its own benefit. We understand that's the logical result of the government being uh, an unethical political beast that controls too much resources. All of that is uh, completely true. Look, the way forward, yes, is to impose on the government a great deal uh, more transparency. It is not the secrecy per se that is the problem with our government. The problem with our government is it does stupid shit that's not in your interest. It does so that's in the interest of the politicians and the unelected bureaucrats that run it. These people uh, collect resources to gain power for themselves for them to stay in power. Uh, the politicians nowadays adopt as their number one priority, keeping the other party out of power. And we know that this is where authoritarianism comes from in a democracy. It used to be, Melissa, you're a little young, you'll have to ask your parents. It used to be that we always thought that authoritarianism could not grow in the United States. We used to make fun of other democracies around the world where you would see a growing sense of authoritarianism. But we see it growing today in the United States, and it comes from the idea that a politician believes that he or she can gain power by giving up on what used to be the political agenda. You see this in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, in spades, and leverage fear by saying what you really have to fear is not the loss of your civil liberties, what you really have to fear is that other idiot coming to power. I am here to save you. And so we have politicians who argue, well, I can save you from COVID. I can save you from fill in the blank, right? Russia, China, uh, whatever future catastrophe is around the corner. And we need to make sure that we hold these people accountable. Emmanuel is absolutely right about that. We need greater transparency. 
we need to stop allowing our government to make everything classified so that we don't get to see what they're doing. We need to stop the government from prosecuting journalists for disclosing information about the bureaucracy. Wow. That's, uh, you know, I would like to say that that's a 19th century concept, but it's not. We need to stop our government from working with social media companies to censor us. Wow. Um, we're really in a, in a bad spot here. And I would argue that we're accelerating in the wrong direction rather than electing <clears throat> politicians that'll stand up for our rights. I, I agree with that so much because I think transparency for my generation is going to be one of the most important things because we see through so much baloney and we're so tired of it that it, like take for example these huge bills with like a thousand or ten thousand pages and no one has time to read that so in my opinion all those bills that were passed that weren't just one issue bill plain and simple that could be read in a few hours not a few months i think those are all invalid if you ask me they're just they were just basically peer pressure things that got pushed through when no one even knows what's in there until they want to like take something out of their little hat and go, oh, well now I can ruin you with this because we passed this bill that no one even knew that they passed. So transparency is so important. And also like one issue bill. And I do think we need to look into the fact that all of those past bills with more than one issue should be rendered invalid at, at some point. It, I know it's be hard, but we need to somehow do that, I think. So what do you think about, uh, is that a goal that can be accomplished, do you think? Certainly going forward, we can pressure the, particularly the Senate, which is where this uh, would have a chance of working, but in uh, the House of Representatives as well, we can pressure these bodies to, uh, enact only legislation that is of a single issue and have them impose rules on themselves. We can also hope to elect a libertarian-minded, if not a libertarian party, candidate to the White House who would veto anything based on an advance pledge, right? What you need is a president who will in advance pledge to veto anything that is a multi-topic bill. The problem, of course, is that uh, the counter argument so often carries the day, right? The counter argument is, well, we have all these uh, complex issues and the only way to cut a political deal is to bring them all together. And so there is an enormous pushback to, to overcome. The other thing is that we need uh, a libertarian minded president uh, to in advance pledge to veto anything that uh, increases spending from the government. That alone would cut a lot of the, the BS coming from, from Capitol Hill. And without those advanced pledges in policy, you're dead in the water. You have to have commitments from these people before they get to Washington. I'd like to... Um add and maybe emmanuel you'd like to talk you wanted to talk about how the government might be reformed with your ideas and the role of government um but if i could lead off with a question in that that uh, i'd like to know what each of you would do when that special moment comes when uh, you become president i'm not sure if they give you a parking spot at the white house but you're living at the white house and you're in the oval office and that moment comes when the Joint Chiefs of Staff come into the Oval Office to meet with you. And it's in those kind of meetings, I pretty much think we all could agree, some of the pressure to continue the warrantless spying is applied. So we have a situation where most of the public, if not you know, a high degree of percentage of the public, is opposed to having uh, mass bulk surveillance, as it's called. And yet the politicians keep on reauthorizing and voting for it, 
even though the people who put them in office have asked them not to do that. So this is uh, led, led to discussions where people think there must be a moment where candidates who have conviction and have their opinions of transparency are brought into a room somewhere, whether it's the Pentagon or the White House or the Capitol building, and the pressure is applied to get them to change their um, position on upholding the Constitution. So they have made a conscious decision not to follow the Constitution. In the example of 702 reauthorization, for example, how are you going to stand up to these guys? And people have told me pheromones have a, a something to do with it, which are these smells which we might not even know are in the room, but simply come <clears throat> from the presence of certain people. How are you going to stand up to the Joint Chiefs of uh, Staff and some of these tough people in Congress who want to keep the mass surveillance going on? Um, let's start with you, Mike, and then Emmanuel. Sure. You've got to be able to pledge in advance and run on a platform in advance so that by the time you get there, your hands are virtually tied, right? Ladies, gentlemen, I don't have a choice. I cannot go along with this BS any longer. The American public expects otherwise. And so it's unrealistic for you to expect me to go along with this. There are a number of things that an administration can do to right this ship. Uh, it is true, as the pushback will, uh, will indicate on the other side of the argument, that a lot of this is controlled by legislation and prior court cases. But an administration can shut down a lot unilaterally. And one of the best tools for doing so, there's only a certain number of employees you can fire, but that is not an insignificant number, by the way. But the rest of them can be redeployed to other agencies through a, a, a detailing process, basically. And what you want to do is fundamentally break up agencies like the CIA and the FBI and the NSA. You cannot allow them to continue to control the level of resources that they do now. Because fundamentally, fundamentally, the problem is not merely limited to a surveillance program, as horrific as that is. More fundamentally is that these agencies exist to gain power to themselves. It is, they, are, they are run by people who have a different set of values than you do, who believe that all this is a good idea. You can't let that continue. It's like whack-a-mole. Even if you were to suppress you know, a surveillance program here or there, a spy program here or there, uh, a foreign leader assassination program here or there, uh, an assassination drone program here or there, it's whack-a-mole. You can't run a policy by just suppressing individual programs once in a while. You have to fundamentally change these agencies. Moving legislation against them right away to sunset them completely lock, stock, and barrel is impossible on day one. You have to reduce their political power first. Then, once that's completed, you can move legislation against them just like the Federal Reserve System or any other powerful organization in Washington that has its own very powerful political base. You have to take away its resources, render it more irrelevant, more incapable of doing the stupid crap that it's been doing. And then after a period of time, after it's diminished, then you can move legislation against them. But the fundamental problem is these agencies themselves, not merely a specific program. Emmanuel, please. Oh, you're muted. Uh, this is the point where I think we get into a debate. Uh, so uh, I, I would, I think I fundamentally disagree with this uh, description of what's happening. I mean, not, not what's happening, but what the cause is behind it. Uh, so the mass surveillance program, let's just focus on that is not the result of the CIA, the NSA, intelligence community, uh, but rather it's a result of the outsourcing of these functions to Microsoft, Oracle, Cisco, uh, 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 and Google, uh, and Amazon, and a series of other, uh, MITRE, 
Cassie, I could list uh, the other uh, private intelligence firms, and that the privatization of government functions is what really is the problem here. So these companies are interested in profit, they lobby, they do both sides. They lobby to get the money, and then they steal it from the taxpayers through these privatized programs. So the, the, the way to undo this is first to realize that these corporations, which are pretending to be the federal government on through various different forms, and that includes uh, uh, Grumman or, or for that matter, Lockheed Martin, uh, that they are not the government. Uh, uh, they function like the government, but they have to be gotten out of the whole system. Uh, that means ending lobbying. Uh, it means ending, uh, 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 empowering government in a sense, getting a small group of committed people who follow the constitution in the tradition actually that the United States was founded upon certain models from Greece and Rome of, vert, of commitment by intellectuals uh, to government service and to the community as a whole, and that that has to be the core of government. So in a sense, what we really need is a more powerful government, a powerful in an ethical, moral sense, in a structural sense, and to get rid of uh, uh, the, the parasites, essentially. Uh, and behind that, I think we really have to look, uh, the Federal Reserve, I think we both agree on this, but really uh, get a little bit deeper into that, how a certain group of, of, of trusts uh, offshore have extended their power uh, through a series of private banks in the United States, multinational private equity, and firms like BlackRock, which are sort of a, a mixture of private intelligence, uh, investment, analysis, uh, and lobbying interests, and, and more now, and that these parasitic creatures which have latched onto the federal government are really what's behind. And to say, so I would disagree to say that we need to cut back the government. We have to cut back this cancerous combination of government and corporate interests. But the corrupting part of it, the, the most deadly part of it, is not the uh, slow-moving, uh, follow-the-rules uh, bureaucrat, but rather uh, the malicious a small group of families, probably 100 families uh, in the world who control hundreds of billions of dollars in assets and control trillions of dollars to their various trusts and funds, and that we really have to take on these players uh, before we can talk about anything else. Speaking of transparency, we have a congressman in Arizona named Paul Gosser, and he introduced the resolution onto the floor where members of Congress would participate in a voluntary pilot program of wearing a discreet body cam, a body cam, the similar that police officers wear, body-worn video cameras, and that the live stream feed would go to a public website where people could see the elected officials wearing a body cam while they were at work. And this body cam would be removed in classified or strategy sessions or in areas that might involve the privacy of a constituent so that they would be turned off. And of course, when the um, elected official is not at work. Candidates, Termot, um, past Reich, what do you each think about body cams for Congress as a measure of transparency? Uh, let's go with you, Emmanuel. Uh, I ha well, I have never heard this proposal before, so I hesitate to make uh, any comment uh, in a rash and an unthinking manner. Uh, obviously, uh, body cams can be useful in many situations, uh, but uh, surveillance state uh, whether you label it one way or another, is, is a high risk. So I guess um, I would be very careful. Uh, I would think very carefully before endorsing such a plan. And I would put behind that, I guess, I, I had put forth a proposal in one of my speeches for a constitution of information, but we live in an information society. We're driven increasingly by the control of information. So to create a sort of balance of, of, of powers to control how information is, is uh, uh, distributed, access to it, uh, is something which is very critical for our future. Uh, and I am very opposed. I, I, uh, the whole classification system now, secret, top secret, and then a whole variety of, 
of little pieces of it uh, that essentially deprive citizens of access to information about what's happening in the world. We, this is a very serious crisis now, especially with nanotechnology and development of nano weapons, in which basically no one in the entire government knows the weapons that are being developed or what they're going to be used for. And that's uh, uh, extremely, extremely dangerous. So uh, uh, I agree with transparency. I think that uh, class fit, class classified operations should be very limited uh, and should have very limited time uh, scales uh, for uh, the, the secrecy. Um, in terms of the idea of just surveilling everybody, uh, this is uh, something I would be very hesitant uh, to, uh, to uh, assign on to uh, at this point. Mike, body camps for Congress, what do you think? <laughs> Fundamentally, I don't really have a problem with it. They're public servants. If uh, someone gets them to vote themselves uh, to wear a body cam, uh, you know, uh, I think that that's fine. I do think it's silly to think that this is going to fix anything, however, especially if, you know, you're going to allow them to turn it off during classified briefings. It's only classified areas where we need more transparency. I would r rather put more stock in an idea that I've been pushing, which is, when the administration changes, you need to set, for example, an 18 month clock that says everything is going to be declassified unless the agency in charge of the information can make a damn good case that it needs to remain classified. And that agency would have to make that case to me, right? To the White House, uh, to whoever the incumbent uh, president is not to some panel, not to Congress, not to the Defense Department. Someone would have to make a case to presumably the General Counsel's Office of the White House that something needs to remain classified. The problem is that the government does all kinds of stuff that is not in our interest and then covers it up through the classification process. This is a problem. You look at the most recent uh, whistleblower last year who was prosecuted, the Air Force corpsman who who blew the whistle on uh, the fact that there was so much information suggesting that the war in Ukraine was not going well, right? And and posted this online and he's being prosecuted for it. I, I understand all that from the government's point of view. The problem is that the information that he was trying to release, right, which was classified. So none of this is a problem that would be fixed by forcing Congress or anybody else to wear a camera in unclassified areas. The problem was they wouldn't let them release it because it was classified. The problem is that that information talked about how poorly the war in Ukraine is going. Now, think about that. Do the Russians already know how the war in Ukraine is going? Of course they do. Do the Ukrainians already know how well the war is going? Of course they do. Who is it? From whom are we keeping this information? We are keeping this information. <clears throat> from the American public. It's only the American public who doesn't know how this is going, right? Well, and arguably the Russian public and the Ukrainian public, but foreign governments already have these answers. And so we're prosecuting someone for releasing information to the American public that foreign governments already are damned well aware of. That's the fundamental problem. Melissa, do you have any questions? Okay. Um, could we both get your comments on um, Edward Snowden? It seems he is a pretty uh, hot topic to understand where somebody thinks that he committed crimes or maybe that he's a patriotic American. We've had more than 10 years to think about Ed Snowden. He still can't come home to see his mother and father. Uh, what do you think, uh, candidate Termot? What do you think about Ed Snowden? Well, both are true. He committed a crime and uh, he's a patriot. He committed a crime because crime is defined by the US government. He had the stones to do it anyway. He knew damn well he was committing a crime. He knew damned well that he would probably be prosecuted for it, that it would change his life forever and not a good way. I think that's the definition of courage. Even, even if you disagreed with him, and I don't, I'm glad he did what he did. But even if you disagree with him, right, 
and you think he should have shut the hell up and you're mad that he disclosed all this information. You have to hand it to him. That took stones and I'm proud of him. Having said that, the information that he disclosed absolutely needed to be disclosed. It revealed that the government of the United States of America was operating in an unconstitutional manner. I don't know how it is that you could possibly have a court. This is rhetorical. I know damn well how the system works. I was a cop for a dozen years. But rhetorically speaking, I think it's really an open question for the ages how it is that we have come into a situation where the the government of the United States prosecutes people for disclosing that the government was doing something that's unconstitutional. We need to let that sink in. It is case 1A, right? Illustrating that the government is hiding things because it knows damned well that if you found out, you'd be pissed. This is proof that the government is run by people who operate by a different set of principles than you do. I, this is not a this is not a metaphor. This is this is actually what's happening, and I think that it's high time that the American people stop wasting their votes on parties that bring politicians to power who want to use the government in ways that do not align with your values, and start voting for politicians based on their values. Yes, transparency. Yes, fiscal conservatism and a different style of foreign policy and a different style of monetary policy, criminal justice reform fundamentally and avoiding stupid things like leveraging fear to impose uh, the regime as they did during the COVID mania. These are all fundamental changes that we can make. Emmanuel? Uh, so regarding uh, Edward Snowden, uh, it's a complicated issue, uh, and uh, it's difficult to explain it in one in something that someone can just get in a sound bite. Uh, obviously, I should say, I think he personally was extremely uh, well intentioned and brave in his efforts, uh, and that it was it served a positive overall a positive role uh, in uh, raising awareness about criminality within uh, the government and, of course, within corporations as well. Uh, There are two uh, important uh, footnotes I'd want to add to that. Uh, The first is Edward Snowden became famous around the world. Uh, Everybody knows who he is. Uh, I have some experience in this field. Uh, I can tell you what happens if you're an intelligence officer and you come out with classified materials and you give them to the newspapers. They won't take them. Uh, And if you did something like that, uh, you would be unemployed for 30 years, teaching at a community college or forced out of the country. So it's not the normal situation that if you released classified information that you would become world famous and show up on TV. So this suggests that there were interested parties who were somehow playing with uh, Snowden. And I, my s- saying this without clear evidence is that there was an interest in privatizing the NSA, breaking it up and selling it off to Amazon, Oracle, and others uh, as a way of essentially destroying government supervision, and that that was part of why Snowden became so famous. So that may not have been his intention, but there was an aspect to it which I think we need to think carefully about. The second part, I would say, is that what Snowden released was very selective. Uh, Now, he said it was because he didn't want to do anything that would endanger uh, officers who were serving overseas. But I, from my own experience, I watched what happened with the criminal regime under the Bush administration, the way they seized power in December, uh, well, say February of 2001, uh, the various criminal actions they engaged in, the 9-11, the buildup to it and after it all number of extremely criminal actions, which said, which essentially showed that the entire government was a criminal agency. Nothing that Snowden re- uh, released indicated that level of criminality in the United States. It was in a way uh, sort of uh, uh, scattershot, little uh, incidents, but not the profound criminalization of the entire government. And that part I, was, I found rather disappointing. And it made me wonder 
uh, whether we were really getting at things uh, through Snowden. But I, I, I won't disagree that he was well-intentioned, uh, that he was brave. Uh, uh, but I, I would, as a footnote, say that he was not alone. And there were many people who did things like him who you've never heard of. Oh, you're you're muted again. Okay, we have just a few more minutes. Yeah. Lala, do you want to ask any last questions? Um, I don't know. It's it's hard to come up with questions when there's good speakers because you guys have kind of answered the questions before, as they come up. You've already answered them. So, um, oh, let me think. Yeah, I just think what we were saying earlier about like the classified information is so true because we're not living in an isolated world anymore. We have the internet, we're all connected globally. So to classify, declassify things for war strategy or whatever, well, you you can be talking to someone on X or TikTok or something like this from anywhere in the world. And so there's no more gaslighting by government because of the global information sharing. So it, it basically classifying things and hiding things were just a way of gaslighting the public. So, but they can't do that anymore. So it is very futile. So I'm glad how you brought that up. Um, yeah. So maybe I, I can say something about social media. Is that since you mentioned that? The part of me about social media. Yeah, there's social media. There's so many, too many ways for us to communicate that governments of the world, the entire world, can't gaslight people anymore. They try to censor us on social media, but it doesn't work. We find other ways, and they, it just, they're being exposed for what they are. They're just gaslighting the public for their own self interest. And it should be about public service, like more about things like the roads. It shouldn't be regulating anything. Like, like to do with space and all of these things that we're talking about. I think it, it should be completely about like cut and dry, black and white issues like the roads, uh, maybe help with a little bit the hospital and, and things like that. Instead of all, they, they've expanded so far into the, the cookie jar of our taxes that it's, it's just gotten out of hand to every single aspect of our lives. And I think the government reach needs to be minimalized. Maybe not the government power, but definitely the government reach and what they have power over. Like they shouldn't have, be surveilling the public. They're the public servants. Yes, I, I do believe in the body cams for Congress because they're a public servant. Whereas the public themselves, they're private. So they should have the privacy. It should be the other way around now. So yeah, I, I just, I, I really enjoyed both of your perspectives today, and it was nice meeting you. Yeah. Let's um, invite both candidates back and um, talk for longer. There's a whole bunch of questions that would be fun to talk about. But could we both um, take the last word to talk about whatever you each want in closing statements? But before you do, both of, both of you, are you planning on exercising the write-in vote or mike you're with the green party is there are you getting your name on any ballots or are you going to use the write-in no 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 i'm with the libertarian party and we will have I'm ballot sorry, access right. in all 50 states uh and so my name or if i do not secure the nomination the name of uh one of the other guys who is seeking the nomination uh will be on the ballot so there will be a libertarian line on everybody's ballot. We're working very hard in New York and Illinois as we speak uh, to make sure that those uh, are the last two states that in, in which we collect enough signatures to make sure that we're on, on the ballot. And so in that sense, uh, we are not just a third party, as I mentioned, but the third party. We will be the third party with ballot access in all, all 50 states. And... Uh, you know, thanks for the time here. I'll just uh, mention real quick in closing that uh, I agree that the the power of the state and the reach of the state needs to be cut back, but it is both. It's the power and the reach. 
Government is a parasite in our lives. We know this. We know empirically, objectively speaking, our economy works better when government has as light a touch as absolutely possible. The only legitimate role for the federal government is to keep us safe from foreigners. And that does not happen by projecting military hegemony around the world. We have seen ethics aside, right? I've got an ethical problem with the projection of military hegemony around the world. But even if you thought that that was ethically acceptable, the truth of the matter is that the government of the United States has prosecuted a foreign policy for generations around the world that makes us less safe, not more safe, and has brought us closer to World War III, not farther away from it. And so it is, I believe, an obligation for Americans to vote your values. Stop wasting your vote. And I would invite everyone to check out our websites. You can go to MikeTremont.com, which is the basic uh, campaign website. Tremont is tricky to spell because it has two A's. Easier to spell than MikeTremont.com is GoldNewDeal.org. GoldNewDeal.org is the website that hosts our basic platform. Our platform we call a Gold New Deal because we're talking about a fundamentally different relationship between us and government rolling back the original New Deal that was pursued under Franklin Roosevelt. We're obviously making a little bit of fun of AOC's Green New Deal, but it's in pursuit of a relationship in which the government bothers you a great deal less, allows you and your local government to pursue a political path to the future that is more under your control and more in alignment with your values. And then the the last website that I would uh, flag for you is that we have an artificial intelligence bot up and running, an AI bot that we call Lisa, the Libertarian Intelligence System application. Lisa is very fun. You can find it at libertarianintelligence.org. And if you can't remember libertarianintelligence.org, which is really a mouthful, you can go to either goldnewdeal.org or mytramont.com and connect from there. And you'll find that it's a lot of fun. It is a bot that is trained to answer questions the way a libertarian would. And so it's a very fun vehicle to spread the idea of libertarianism and the solutions that go with that. So if anyone wants to reach out to me personally, my contact information is on the websites. Feel free to do so. Get involved with the campaign. Vote your values. Stop wasting your vote. Super, Emmanuel. And we will run both candidates' um, email addresses in just a couple of minutes. Emmanuel, please, last comments. Well, I, I think any candidate who takes on uh, the massive state crimes uh, and the criminal nature of uh, governance, the merger of multinational corporations and banks, uh, with the federal government uh, is going to have a lot of trouble raising money for a campaign. So uh, I, I'm not sure how many uh, state ballots I'll be on. I would only be able to write in, like was in the case in 2020. In the case of 2020, uh, I was essentially uh, driven out of the country within two weeks of declaring my candidacy. So they give you some sense of the stakes involved. So I, I can't do uh, what Mike is doing, and I support Mike's efforts. If I can't be successful, uh, I hope that 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 he will be. Uh, but I would say, if through some uh, uh, circumstances I was able to advance uh, further, uh, that I would my position would be uh, somewhat different. Uh, first would be to say uh, that we go back to the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence makes clear uh, what the United States is. Uh, it's a democracy, it's a republic, but it is also a revolutionary uh, tradition. And that revolution, the, the Declaration of Independence, in, empowers the citizens to engage in revolutionary activity if the government uh, or the, the system of governance no longer serves its purpose. Uh, and that we need to take a stand and say, it may seem ridiculous at first, but it has worked historically in the past, in other ages, to take the stand and say that we don't accept any of this, that the entire system is corrupt, that all of these 
congressmen uh, are engaged in state crimes uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and that this, that it, although it may seem more extreme, it is in some ways the more rational approach. And I'll close by saying uh, that the difference here is that the alternative to the government, uh, to the federal government, or, or for that matter, the state government, which is mimicking the uh, federal government in many respects these days, uh, is not uh, uh, multinational corporations, it's not banks, it's not uh, the private sector, but rather it is the community and the citizens themselves. And that's really what our founding fathers were talking about in the best of what they wrote, uh, and that's how we have to do it. So we have to build communities between ourselves to define we follow the Constitution, we follow ethical principles, we follow the Declaration of Independence, and we do not recognize this federal government, and we do not re recognize any of these uh, outsourcing efforts by multinational corporations that take over the federal government. And although this may seem like a uh, pyrrhic uh, effort, uh, I think that it has the potential to alter the course of political discourse in the United States and to get back to an ethical uh, and a a simple uh, and and ultimately small government one, but it, the the enemy here is not bureaucrats in government. It's a narcissistic, indulgent culture and a effort which is going on right now by various multinational IT firms to confuse, to dumb down the population, to induce uh, sort of addiction to uh, stimulation, to pornography, to games, to gambling, and that this is an assault on the people. It's a war against us, and it's conducted by players larger than just the federal government. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Mike, uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk with you. I know how busy you are, uh, and, uh, and thank thanks you. for everything. Thank you. Okay, so I will invite both candidates to come back and we'll have a great time talking. By the way, this is the only um, race that I've ever seen that had presidential candidates with PhDs. So the public, I think, is looking for new candidates and we have real solutions. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I'm going to run a short video that has the candidates' websites and that's the last we'll see of everyone. So now's a good time to say goodbye. Goodbye and thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Lala.